Well, good morning once again. Good to see everybody here on a beautiful day like this. Thank you so much, worship team. I, I have to say it every Sunday. I so very much appreciate them for uh, softening hearts, uh, making us more receptive to the word, you know, kind of like Elisha. I think I've mentioned that before. Elisha the prophet said, I, I will not prophesy until the minstrel play. Hearts need to be softened, and, and our worship team does a great job. The great apostle Paul, yeah. Very good. Uh, the great apostle Paul, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel. He says, Paul said, woe is me if I, if I preach not the gospel. Paul was fixated on this thing called the gospel. Uh, whatever else the Bible might want to talk about, it's the gospel that's central. Absolutely central. What is the gospel, anyhow? Well, the gospel means good news. That's right. The good message. The euangelion. The good message. What is it? And the Bible teaches, very simply, that God created a good world. It was a world in which there, there was no death or suffering, sickness, sorrow, pain, natural disaster. There was nothing like that in the original creation. And God's first two human beings he put on the planet willfully rebelled against him, broke his wise laws, and they became sinners. And God says, I don't turn a blind eye to moral evil in my universe. And that's going to be punished, you know? And, and that brought death into the world, that rebellion, that breaking of God's wise moral laws. And that couple that became sinners, guess what sinners beget? More sinners, just like cats beget kittens and dogs beget puppies, sinners make more sinners. And, and here we are, we're, we're the prodigy. And that's bad news. That, that, you know, you're born in sin, you're born into it. You don't have to tell a little child how to lie or be selfish. We're constantly trying to teach our kids to be good, to be loving, be kind, be forgiving. Why? Because it doesn't come naturally. Sinning comes naturally. And the wages of sin is death. Physical death, the body dies, the spirit leaves the body. And spiritual death, your spirit, your soul spirit goes to, into a place where God is not. Right, the horrible place. We call it hell, right? I mean, that's the bad news, and you've got to tell people the bad news before you can tell them the good news, the gospel. What's the gospel? Jesus Christ came into the world, the sinless Son of God. Never sinned. Perfect, impeccable, could not sin. Lived a sinless life and died on a cross. Why did he die? To pay for my sin, to pay for your sins. He took the punishment for the sins of the world. And now you appropriate the benefits of what he did by faith alone. You don't, it doesn't cost you money. You don't have to join a club. It's between you and God. I believe that you did that for me, dear Jesus. Forgive me. Uh, apply what you did to my account. Make me white as snow, right, spiritually. Wash my sins away. You know, the Bible says if you'll accept what Jesus did on faith, he will forgive you, and you'll be born again. You'll be something new on the inside. You become a new creature, Paul says it. And you get a home in heaven waiting for you, reserved in heaven. It can never be taken away. It's yours forever. That's good news. That's the good news. Now, of course, it's a whole other issue. Why should you believe a story like that? I mean, there's lots of stories out there. Why believe this story? Well, I think I could show that this is a necessarily true story. This is a rationally uh, necessary story. It has to be true. It's not our purpose this morning to do that, but we could do it. And you've heard me go through that before. But I just think it's important to hear the gospel from time to time in church. It's the most important message the world's ever heard. And it rings true with most people. It's what you're going to do with that thing that rings so true. Will you accept the Lord Jesus or deny and suppress that truth? Well, we're in the book of Genesis today. We've been going through the Bible. This is our ambitious task under God, to go through the whole Bible. We're still in that very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis tells us about a very special family that God called 2,000 years ago, or sorry, 2,000 years before Christ, 4,000 years ago. God called a man, Abraham, said, you will be the father of a new people group, Abraham, you're going to be the father of the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. 
And Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And we're zeroing in on one of those sons of Jacob right now. Jacob's son, Joseph. Why are we so interested in this family anyways? This is why. Because from that family, and we're going to track it as we move through the Bible, one day from that family would come the Lord Jesus himself, the one that would pay our sin debt on that cross. We were very interested in that family. The Bible wants us to know all about it. The Bible wants us to know all about this lineage from which comes the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the central figure. He's the center of the center of the Christian faith. Lots of things we can talk about. The Bible has lots of perspectives on lots of things, but he is central, and he must never, ever, ever be set aside, ignored, denied, eclipsed by anything. Jesus Christ, to him belongs the preeminence in all things, right? And so we're very interested in what the Bible is interested in, namely the Lord Jesus, central, but now the family from which Jesus descends. So we're in chapter 37 of uh, Genesis. Let's look at Genesis 37. Gen 37 verse 1. And Jacob dwelled in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. Today, if you look at a map, you'll see a little sliver uh, right there north of the Dead Sea. Sea of Galilee in the north, Dead Sea in the south, a little sliver of territory. Uh, and on the left, you see the, the Mediterranean. And that's Israel, the land of Israel. That's what we're talking about. What the Jewish people, what the land of Israel has today is a tiny little portion of what God has promised them, but they are there in the land, and we're talking about that region here, the land of Canaan. And verse 2 now, it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Several things we want to notice here. Uh, first of all, look at that. It says in verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob, and then we start talking about Joseph. Uh, that's, the old, that's the Old Testament way of, uh, of uh, recording family history. It's kind of like the sign-off at the end of a letter. Okay, now we're done talking about Joseph. These are the generations of Joseph. Now we're on to, ja uh, sorry, we're done with Jacob. Now we get on to Joseph. These are the generations of Jacob. We're done with him. Joseph is now going to take the center stage. Okay, notice that these are the generations of is a phrase that you see all through the Bible, all the way through, uh, especially the book of Genesis, chapters 1 to 50. The book of Genesis is tied together with that phrase, all 50 chapters. So when our liberal friends want to say that Genesis chapters 1 to 11 can be chopped off as fiction, we need to remind them that the whole book is knit together as a unit with that phrase, these are the generations of, ties the whole book together. It's important. Uh, we also learned that um, Joseph, uh, he's out there with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha, his father's wives. Does the, is the Bible happy with plural marriage? No. Very important we understand this. Several places in the scriptures were told the man is to have one wife. God created Adam and Eve. Jesus was questioned on marriage. He said, have you not read, he that made them at the beginning made them male and female. One man, one woman for one lifetime, that is the biblical prescription for marriage. Okay? But the Bible is truthful as it gives us history. Okay? It records history. It just tells us what happened and doesn't necessarily endorse all the things that people did. Very important that we understand the difference between historical narrative, here's what happened, and God's saying, this is what ought to happen. This is my prescriptions for right living for you. You can't just go to historical narrative, pull out some horrible thing that people were doing and say, hey, look, it's in the Bible, I can do it. No, because if you keep reading, oftentimes these bad decisions have tragic results. So it's very important we read the Bible uh, correctly. Read it right, okay? Uh, now it tells us in verse 2 that uh, Joseph gave an evil report about his brethren. Because he's got 11 brothers, and he's, he's reported back to the dad something bad about them. What was it? We don't know. The, uh, the Bible's silent on it. We don't know. Uh, we, we don't know enough about this family to know whether or not uh, Joseph might just be a little snitch, ratting on his brothers. Uh, but as we read the narrative, we realize, no, Joseph is a good guy. 
He's one of those very few in the Bible of whom nothing wicked is written. Most of the characters in the Bible, even the good guys, have serious character flaws. But Joseph, we don't read anything about that. He's a good guy. His brothers, on the other hand, we read about it. What a horrible bunch. It's hard to imagine the Lord Jesus would choose to be born into a family like that. What a line. Uh, but the Bible's being truthful to us. Verse 3, now look at verse 3. Now Israel, and that's Jacob. Remember, Jacob had his name changed to Israel. So Israel is, is Jacob. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their, father, that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Uh, yes, I think this thing called the dysfunctional family is nothing new. <laughs> it's old. It's been going on for millennia. What is the problem? I mean, you've got this... Uh, let's just look at the most obvious. Favoritism in the family. Dad loves one child more than the others. Favoritism. The Bible frowns on that. God doesn't show favoritism. We're not to show favoritism. Uh, in the book of James, there's a big deal made of that. If someone comes in and they're obviously poor and they're wearing raiment that looks like they're obviously poor, you show that man the same dignity as a rich person walking in here with goodly apparel and a, and a gold ring on his hand. You give him the same place you would give the rich person. There is no favoritism in God's economy. And yet in this home here, which as far as we know is the most godly home on planet Earth at the time, look at this horrible favoritism going on here. Uh, I, could I just share something with you? When I was much younger, and uh, all we had at the time was Alicia. She was a, just a spiky-haired little, little thing. And, and Lenny and I just loved our daughter so much, just this little toddler. And, and we decided we were going to have another child who turned out to be Samuel. And I really worried about it, that I loved this little girl so much, could I love the new child as much? This is, this is like a stranger coming into the home. Could I love that new child uh, as much? And then, of course, when the baby's born and introduced to the family, uh, you instantly realize you were thinking wrong all along. Love is not supposed to be like a big pepperoni pizza where you dole out slices, and then all of a sudden you're out. Sorry, I have nothing left for you now. I'm all out of pizza. I'm all out of love. No, it's, it's not supposed to be like that. In your home, it's more like a flame, right? Like a candle. And I can share, I can put flame on your candle and on your candle, and I've shared my flame with everybody, and I haven't lost a thing. And that's how your home is supposed to be. And of course, that, that's not the way it is in Jacob's home. And his, uh, his other sons hate Joseph for this. And, and you know, uh, even though this is not correct, even though he should not be giving special love to his one son, and his brothers should not be hating Joseph, in a strange way, we do have a little hint of Jesus here. You see, because Jesus is the special and unique Son of God. And God the Father loves Jesus in a special and unique way. I mean, he has a, a special relationship with his Father that we don't have. Jesus is as, just as divine as the Father. Jesus has existed with the Father from all eternity. It's a special kind of love, eh? Special kind of relationship. We're called into that. If you like exercise faith in Jesus, you're called into that fellowship. And that's part of the good news. But there's a special relationship between Father and Son, and also this. When Jesus was born into the world and took on a human nature, guess who hated him? His brethren. His other brothers and sisters of Mary didn't believe. And also his Jewish brethren, many didn't believe. And also brethren, just by nature of being a human being, he was called our brethren, and most did not believe Jesus. The Bible says in John 1.11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. And Jesus says in John, the 15th chapter, they hated me, and they'll hate you too. And that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow. This world hates the gospel message. They, honestly, they do. Most people just, it's, I don't want to be called a sinner. You mean I'm a sinner? I'm immoral? I've broken God's moral laws? I don't like that. I'm a pretty good person. Well, you, you know what? In my books, you are a good person for the most part. The problem is, on the Judgment Day, my books aren't the ones opened. It's God's books that will be opened, His holy standards. He's going to judge every thought that's ever come into your mind, every word you've ever uttered, every deed you've ever performed. 
And God says, you've fallen short. I've got a solution for you. Will you accept what Jesus did? He's paid for all, all your sins if you'll accept it. But if you're too proud to accept it, then there's no recourse. You put yourself beyond the reach of Christ. And, and God doesn't want that for you. So the world hates, uh, hated Jesus. It'll hate his followers. And, uh, well, J Joseph's brethren hated him, right? But uh, we're about to amplify the problem here. Take a look, please, at verse 5. Now, Joseph is going to play the role of a prophet now. Of course, Jesus was a prophet, the greatest of all of Israel's prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But Joseph gets a prophetic dream. Now, listen to the dream. Verse 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here, I pray thee, the dream which I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shall we, or sorry, shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So they, the brethren, they get that prophetic dream. Joseph's sheave in the field stands up, and their sheaves bow down and do obeisance to his. Uh, Joseph, I don't think, I think the flavor here uh, indicates to me he really wasn't trying to offend them. He was just sort of being naive, 17 years old. I think he's just being naive. He just says, listen to this amazing dream I had, so vivid. And, of course, uh, the brothers hate him for this. He has another dream. This one's very interesting. I want to spend just a couple minutes on this one. Look, please, at verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it, he told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down uh, and bow ourselves to the earth to thee? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now that is an interesting dream. Sun, moon, 11 stars bowing down to him. And the father shows up and he says, what is this? See, the, that father Jacob, he's thinking, hey, eh? sun and moon represents me and Rachel, your mom, your, me and your mom. 11 stars represents the brothers bowing down to you. Now, please just turn very quickly. You can hold your place, but go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. The book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 12. Book of Revelation is extremely problematic to a lot of people. Book of Revelation is filled with imagery, symbolical language, very difficult book. Uh, some of the greatest theologians, churchmen throughout the ages threw up, have just thrown up their hands. They said, we can't make heads or tails out of this book. It's just too difficult. Uh, and yet I'd like to say that um, if you've masterminded the other 65 books of the Bible, Book of Revelation is not a locked book anymore. And some of this symbolic language uh, becomes unlocked for you. You start to get the, the, the meaning here. Now, let's just take a look at a couple of verses here from Revelation 12, okay? Here's uh, John sharing with us, with us what he's seen. Chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon, under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Sun and moon, 12 stars, not 11. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another great wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars out of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. You read that and you say, what on earth are we talking about here? <laughs> That's pretty cryptic. Well, I'd like to suggest that the woman 
that John is talking about is the nation of Israel. That woman is Israel. We see uh, she's in proximity to sun and moon. That's Jacob and Rachel. A crown of 12 stars, not 11, 12 stars, 12 sons of uh, Jacob. We have a man-child being born, threatened with destruction as soon as he's born. Who's the man-child? Well, our text tells us uh, that uh, he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Twice in the Bible, we read that the Lord Jesus is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. I would suggest that the woman is the nation of Israel, the 12 stars is the 12 sons of Jacob, sun and moon, Jacob and Rachel, the great red dragon, Satan himself is referred to as Satan in verse 9, wanted to destroy the child as he was born. Remember King Herod wanted to destroy the baby Jesus, sent an army out to Bethlehem to wipe them all out. All the children, that is, under two years of age. I don't know if you understood all that, but I think you're getting the message. The Bible is a complicated book in places. You read it carefully, interpret scripture with scripture, and some of these things that appear to be cryptic and locked and puzzling become unlocked and they become discern very discernible to us. I hope you're seeing here that that woman is the nation of Israel and it's unlocked for us because of this cryptic prayer, or, uh, not prayer, but this dream that we get uh, by Joseph way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. I, when I see things like this in the Bible, I really get the idea that this book is not a human creation. This book took 1,600 years to write. Forty different men, many of whom didn't know each other, in three different languages on three different continents. And you put this entire thing together and you get these little threads of themes running through the whole book that tie together at the end. It's an amazing book. It's not like any other book. Now, thank God, the main things are the plain things. The things you really, really need to know to, to walk a walk that's pleasing to God, to have a right relationship with God, to have salvation, to have a home in heaven, those things are very plain, very easy to understand. You know, the gospel is not hard. But the delicate, precious things, that takes time, eh? That takes a little time to study, read, think about this stuff, meditate on it, pray about it. Interesting, huh? Isn't that interesting? I'm fascinated by stuff like that. But when I see little evidences of divine authorship, it encourages me to keep on reading. And when I come across plain and precious promises of God, it encourages me to believe it. When I look at this and I say, hey, this is not man's book here. This is, this is God's word. I think I can trust what God's telling me. When he tells me about heaven, I think I can trust that. When he tells me about the Lord Jesus, his sinless life, death, and resurrection, his offer to save me, make me something new, give me a home in heaven, give me meaningful work on the earth, his promise to never leave me or forsake me, to walk with me when things are getting really, really tough, his promise to, wait, to, to work all things together for good. I think I can trust that because it's not man's mere, vain, empty promise. This is a promise from Almighty God. Who, the scripture tells us, cannot lie. He doesn't lie to us. He doesn't deceive us. We need to hear that. In a world where everything is changing, everything's up for grabs, everything's in a state of flux, I thank God we've got something rock solid I can hang on to. While everything else becomes a blur, I've got something that is rock solid that can make sense out of an otherwise very senseless world. And I hope that you're encouraged by that too. Now look at uh, verse uh, 12 here. After this uh, sharing of this dream, verse 12, it says, his brethren, his brethren went to feed the father's flock at Shechem. And, his, and Israel said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will, send, uh, I will send thee unto them. And he said, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, that's the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Why, can anyone tell me, why is Jacob so concerned about what's happening with his sons at Shechem? They're tending the flocks at Shechem. He says, Joseph, get over there and let me know how it's going. I'm a little worried about my boys over there. Anyone remember what we talked about last week? Simeon and Levi, two of those boys, just butchered a town of men and took the women captive and took all the spoils uh, and Jacob was very concerned for his own safety. 
He said, the people around here are going to know that we're bad guys and we're going to get it. So, that, and that happened right there at Shechem. So obviously, so obviously he's worried now. Let's make sure there's no retaliation. Joseph, get over there and see how things uh, are going. And so Joseph goes there and take a look at verse 18. And when his, that's the brethren now, they're seeing uh, Joseph approach. When they saw him from afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. You say, oh my, what kind of family is this? This is uh, fatricide. They want to actually kill their brother. They just don't want to rough him up. They actually want to take his life. They conspired against him. Hey, that reminds us of the Lord Jesus too, doesn't it? When the Jewish religious leaders conspired to kill him too, they were just looking for an opportune time. Verse 19, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer comes. Come now, therefore, let us kill him and cast him into some pit, and we will say that some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Look at that plan. They want to take his life. They want cold-blooded murder. And then they want to lie about it. I mean, these guys know this is not good. It's not ignorance here. They're operating out of it. It's sheer hatred for their brother, jealousy, envy. They're going to kill him, and they're going to lie about it deliberately. Well, one of them, the oldest, has at least a flicker of conscience here. Reuben, verse 21. Reuben heard it, and, and he uh, delivered him out of their hands, and he said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. At least one of them has a flicker of conscience. And it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brothers, brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat of many colors that was on him and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. A cistern. A broken cistern. They threw him in there. Stripped him of his robe threw him into the pit. You're going to find out Reuben leaves at this point. At least the boy is safe, he figures. He's gone. But uh, don't we see the Lord Jesus in this too? Years later, many centuries later, Jesus Christ would be roughed up. His robe, gorgeous robe, as Luke describes it, is torn off of him. And he is uh, nailed to a cross. It says here that... Uh, in verse 25, they sat down to eat bread. Ap that is called apathy. That is complete apathy. We don't care anything for this man. I don't think that Joseph is particularly silent during all this. I mean, do, the Bible doesn't tell us that he's saying anything, but I think we could probably figure it out. He's probably pleading for his life. He's saying something. But he's been violently, uh, I mean, accosted, stripped, and thrown into this pit. The Lord Jesus was stripped, nailed to that cross, and guess what? We saw some apathy there too as the soldiers that mocked him and hammered nails into his hands and feet sat down at the foot of that cross, and what did they do? They gambled for his garments. Complete apathy. Apathy, I've got to tell you, is worse than people who are aligned against the Lord Jesus. I like to deal with people who are very much against Christianity. Because they at least got some direction in their thinking. They're thinking about Christianity and they are opposed to it. And they've got reasons why they're opposed to it. And we can talk. And oftentimes, if we sit down and talk, we can get through it. And they can, and they can see things in a better light. And sometimes people, they figure that they actually do want to follow Jesus. But that's a different story than people who are just apathetic. Well, that's good for you. You just go ahead and enjoy that, man. Whatever. Whatever. That's, that's the phrase of today. Whatever. Apathy. Lenny and I were attending a church years ago, and we were ministering to the poor downtown, feeding people out of the back of our van. And we could, use, we could have used a little help doing that, you know? And uh, we we're trying to recruit people in this church. And Apathy. Absolute apathy. If you're not going to do this, do something for the Lord. We actually put up a sign on our, we had a little display trying to recruit people. We didn't recruit a single one. And we had a sign that had the di de uh, dictionary definition of apathy. And I, had, I wrote on the sign, are you apathetic? And you know what the dictionary says under apathy? 
One of the words that defines apathy, spiritless. What a good word, spiritlessness. This is the, the 11 brothers of Joseph, spiritless, it seems, yeah? And those soldiers at the foot of the cross. Of course, we know one of those soldiers at the foot of the cross wasn't going to remain spiritless because one of him, one of them saw the earthquake and, and he heard the rocks rent around him and he saw the sky go black at the crucifixion and he said, this man was the son of God. One of them was not spiritless forever. Well, in the rest of these several verses here, the, the sons of... Uh, Jacob, they see a traveling caravan of merchants and they sell, they sell their brother. They pull him out of the pit and they sell him. 20 pieces of silver, you can have him. He's your servant. Take him. Take him away. Well, of course, remember the Lord Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, handed over to the Jewish religious authorities to be crucified. In turn, handed over to the Romans who would actually carry out the murder. Notice that uh, a little later on, they're going to take Joseph's many colored coat and they're going to dip it in the blood of an animal. They're going to kill an animal and they dip, it, dip, it, dip the robe into the blood. And they're going to show it to the dad. This is all we found of him, this robe dipped in blood. Well, of course, the Bible tells us about the Lord Jesus, you know. When he returns to planet Earth to judge the living and the dead, guess what he's going to do? He's going to come back and it's ghastly, but he's going to slay those who are aligned against him, those that were murdering his servants ruthlessly, those that would not hear the gospel, those that willingly followed Satan and his masterpiece called the Antichrist, Jesus will return, you know, and he will, he will with military force, with an army of one, he was going to slay them all. And the Bible tells us twice, Isaiah 63, Revelation 19, his robe would be dipped in blood, not his own. Kind of like Joseph's robe dipped in blood, not his own. Verse 33, they show the coat to Jacob, uh, to Jacob yes. Is this, is this your son's coat? Verse 33, and he knew it, and he said, this is my son's coat, an evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Little message there, folks. A lot of times the things we're really certain about are wrong. Sheer conviction doesn't mean that what you believe is true. There's only one way to be certain, and that is if God tells you. Because our own sensibilities let us down from time to time, you know. Jacob is certain, without doubt, Joseph is rent in pieces. Well, no, it's not so, Jacob. You're going to find out he's very much alive. It's going to end good. And Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Oftentimes, uh, in, the, in the Bible, when a person is very, very sad, absolutely devastated, they tear their clothes. They rent their garments. You often see it depicted like uh, tearing the shirt open. For, for those listening by MP3, think about Superman opening his shirt. Okay. When, when their heart is, they're exposing their heart. And um, you know, when Jesus was on that cross and he cried out and he died there for your sins and for mine, it says that the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. You remember in Jerusalem, there was a temple there. And the temple is the place where the high priest would go and he would officiate. Once a year, he would go into a special place called the Holiest of Holies. Once a year, Yom Kippur, he would enter through this heavy curtain, the veil, and he would make atonement with blood for the sins of the nation. And it says when Jesus died on that cross, the, t the, the veil was rent, the, the curtain was rent. So the presence of God is now open to those who would want to enter through Christ, through faith in Christ alone now, you can enter the presence of God. It's the only way. The point I'm trying to make here is just as the father was torn with grief and tore his garments, I think we see the father, God the father, I think we see something of his grief as that veil in the temple was rent and the heart of God is exposed to the people. The good news for us is the way is now open. If you'll accept Jesus on faith, you can come to the throne of grace anytime through Christ, through faith in Christ alone. 
This is genuine mourning, though. Jacob is genuinely mourning. He's been devastated. He thinks his beloved son has been killed. Look at this hypocrisy. Would you please look at this? Verse 35, And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, I will go down to the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Look at that wicked, what a wicked bunch. Absolute hypocrisy. There, there, Dad. It's okay. Yes, he was a good boy. Oh, we're going to miss him. Can't you just hear Can't you just hear the hypocrisy? What a wicked bunch. Verse 36. And the Midian sold him, that's, J that's Joseph, sold him unto Pharaoh, oh, sorry, unto Egypt, unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and the captain of the guard. So, uh, in Hebrew, they basically sold Joseph into Egypt, and guess who owns Joseph? Potiphar, who we are told is the chief of the slaughtermen. That's literally what he is. He's chief of the executioners. How would you like a job like that? How would you like to be the servant of that man? He's got no problem taking a life. Look at him the wrong way. Say the wrong thing. Do the wrong thing. Uh, the guy above you is the chief of the slaughtermen. That's difficult. That is very difficult. Would you, would you please agree with me? Joseph has experienced real evil. What his brothers did, that, that is, those are not morally neutral acts. Selling him, wanting to kill him, lying to the dad, being a bunch of hypocrites, those are not morally neutral acts. Those are, that is moral evil. You, you agree with me, right? And by the time we're done with Joseph, he's going to experience a whole lot more moral evil against him. And Joseph is just one of many innocent victims that the Bible talks about and that you've read about in the newspapers. Innocent victims. And this, this comes down to a real serious question. We're all going to just introduce it because I don't want to take, you, you know, take all your time and go way over time, but it's a very serious question. Why does God allow such evil in his universe. We want to say he's an all-good God. We want to say he's all-powerful. And yet, he allows this horrible moral evil to go on. Could, is God, could God just destroy all the evil in the universe right now? Of course he could. Why doesn't he? And the Christian, let's face it, has kind of a problem here. This is the number one excuse people give for not wanting to follow God and be a Christian. Why is the world looking so horrible? I want you to notice something. Our atheists, friends, they've got a problem too. They want to say that evil's real, but they don't believe in God. Yeah, but understand something. You can't have evil unless you have an objective standard of goodness. And what would the locus of objective goodness be if not God? There's no other place to put it. It's a real problem for, for philosophy. It's been a problem for centuries, for millennia. And our Eastern religious friends, the pantheists, want to say that God is real, but evil isn't. Well, evil seems pretty real to me, and probably to you too. Well, we're not going to answer the question in two minutes, but I can introduce you to the answer. And if you ever want to come aside and talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk more about it. We're going to explore this Sunday mornings, because we have to, you know. It seems, as we read the Bible, that God has chosen not to destroy evil outright right now. He has chosen not to destroy it. But, he's instead chosen to defeat it. And we have a part to play in that. He's going to defeat evil. Right now, he allows evil to exist for the purpose of a greater good. He's working these things together to bring about greater goods in the future. When it comes to Joseph, we're going to understand what that is. It's going to, you know, by the time we hit Genesis 50, we're going to go, oh, that's why it happened like that. Maybe in your own life you've passed through some things, and you've looked back years later and you said, oh, that's why. Now I get it. Or maybe not. There are some things we're going to experience in this life that are very, very not pleasant. We may even fall victim to the evil intentions of other people, maybe you have already. And in this life, you may never, ever figure out what the greater good was that God had in mind. But as a Christian, 
you got to say, Lord, I trust you that there is a greater good, that you're working together here. While you're passing through it, you've got God's promises in his word that these things are not for nothing, that he is working these things for the purpose of a greater good. You have his promise that your suffering is finite. It doesn't go on forever. If you trust Jesus, there's a home in heaven for you. There's a new heavens and a new earth waiting for you where you'll never experience sin, confusion, sickness, rebellion, darkness, pain, sorrow, never again. Only righteousness forevermore, and goodness, and love, and peace, and joy. You have the comfort of the scriptures, and you should have comfort, love, support from your church family. A little microcosm here, a little hint of heaven here, where people love each other unconditionally, you know, the way God loves us. We're supposed to exemplify that with one to another. That's what we have in the meantime. And God says that's enough. His grace is sufficient. Okay, I'm not going to belabor the point. How about we pray together, and in the future we are going to explore these things. I don't like the pat answers either. I don't like the simple answers. I don't like people trivializing that which is pretty tough right now. Trivializing the hard things that we may be going through. I don't like that either. I want real answers. I think the Bible gives them real answers. But it's going to take a little time, and we're going to explore them together, okay? Let's do it carefully together. Let's pray.